this lecture will be about the Atalco homology of a curve. And I'm going to take a rather unusual approach to this. So I'm not actually going to tell you what a Talco homology is before calculating the Talco homology of a curve. So the problem is that most introductions to Talco homology, you sort of spend large amounts of time doing abstract category theory and talking about growth and topologies and so on. And this is all very important, but it's also kind of a bit mind numbing. So I'm going to skip over this and just go straight to the interesting part of the calculation. Um, the disadvantage is that you won't actually know what Italco homology means. So um, I guess this is just a sort of overview as motivation for finding the precise definition. So let me give a very quick summary of what an etal sheaf is. So an ordinary sheaf in the Zariski topology is a contravariant functor Um, from open sets of X to sets. So here U is open and X is whatever space we are um, working over. And furthermore, there is some sort of covering condition that I'm not going to worry about because this is a very informal introduction. Um, the difference between that and an etal sheaf is that an etal sheaf is a map from the etal open sets of X, where, where this map is now an etal map and need not be injected. So obvious question is what is an etal map? And I'm not gonna tell you. Um, probably in the next lecture, I'll give a sort of introduction to roughly what etal maps are. Um, but they're a sort of generalization of inclusion of open sets. So, so an etal sheaf is some sort of contravariant functor from these mysterious etal maps to sets. Um, and instead of defining an etal sheaf, I'll just give you some examples. So these are the examples we're going to use. First of all, we have the constant sheaf. So here, if, if I'm given an abelian group A and I'm given an etal open set of X, this is just going to take the etal open set to the set A, at least if U is connected. If U isn't connected, you have to fiddle around a bit more. Um, secondly, we can have the sheaf of regular functions. Um, so this just takes an etal um, open set of X to the, the space of regular functions on, on, on U. Um, so this is very similar to the sheaf of regular functions in the Zariski topology, where we just map any open set U to the, to the um, regular functions on U. Um, one that we're going to use is the sheaf of invertible functions, which is, I'm used to denoting this by GM, which stands for the multiplicative group. And this takes an etal map to the units um, of the regular functions on it. Um, fourthly, we could have the sheaf mu n of nth roots of unity. And this just takes the map tau set to the nth roots of one in O of U. Um, so um, what we want to do is to calculate the etal cohomology groups of a curve and try and show that they're, they're, they're very similar to the usual singular cohomology groups. So, so let's recall the singular cohomology groups of a curve. So this is with integer coefficients and we're gonna work over the complex numbers, otherwise singular cohomology is kind of stupid. And these groups are as follows. They're z for q equals naught, z to the two g, for q equals one and z for q equals two and naught otherwise. Here g is just the genus and x is um, non-singular projective curve over the complex numbers. Now the etal cohomology groups denoted like this of a curve, here we're going to take coefficients 
mod n. And this, we, we want to show that these are z over nz for q equals naught, z over nz for q equals one, so that should be to the two g, and z over nz for q equals two. Here, n is invertible in whatever field k we're working over. Um, and this is very important. In particular, you can't take n equals zero. Well, you, you, you can, but you don't get this answer. And you can't take n to be divisible by the characteristic of the field. Otherwise, again, you get something very weird. Um, so here, x is going to be non-singular projective curve over some field k, which we'll take to be algebraically closed. Um, and the first step in calculating these groups is to find hq of x with coefficients in gm star. So you remember this was invertible, the sheaf of invertible functions on x. It turns out that although this looks more complicated than the, the, than the constant sheaf c over n, in fact, these groups are easier to calculate. And by reducing them, we'll see they get reduced to calculating a Picard variety. And what we do is we write down an exact sequence of sheaves. And the exact sequence looks like this. One goes to GM, goes to, let, let's call this invertible rational functions, sum over X of Z goes to naught. And let's explain what these are. So this stands for invertible regular functions. So in other words, if we've got any et al map, u goes to x, its value on this is going to be the invertible regular functions on u. This stands for the invertible rational functions. And this stands for a copy of z for each closed point x of the curve x. And let's explain what's going on here. So this map here just takes a rational function to the orders of the zero or pole at each point. And what this exact sequence is saying is just saying, if you've got a rational function in here and the order at every zero and pole is zero, in other words, if it's got no zeros and poles, then it's an invertible regular function. So that's a, that's a kind of obvious statement. And this is just a sort of complicated sheaf theoretic way of, of, of saying this. Um, now, for any short exact sequence of sheaves like this, we get a long exact sequence of cohomology groups that I will write out in a moment. Um, and what we want to do is to calculate the cohomology groups of this from the long exact sequence, knowing the cohomology groups of this and this. So we need to know what are the cohomology groups of, of these two objects. Well, first of all, let's look at the cohomology groups of this. Well, here are the cohomology groups. So HQ of sum over Z is equal to zero for Q greater than naught. The reason for this is that this is just a sum, a direct sum of sheaves with support a point. And furthermore, this point is the spectrum of an algebraically closed field. And in et al cohomology, um, um, uh, the spectrum of an algebraically closed field, um, all the higher et al cohomology groups vanish. I, I think that should be a direct sum sign rather than a summation symbol, but never mind. Um, so, uh, these cohomology groups are easy to figure out. Um, now we want to know the cohomology groups of these. And these again all vanish for Q greater than naught, but this takes considerably more effort to see. So I'll, I'll sketch why um, the cohomology groups of this all vanish. Um, so... Um, what we want to know is, is we want to work out the cohomology 
of X with um, respect to the, the, the sheaf of non-zero rational functions. And we can reduce this to working out the cohomology of um, the generic point of X with coefficients in the rational function. So it's really a spectrum of K where K is the field of rational functions on X. And um, a tau cohomology of the spectrum of a field um, turns out to be the same as Galois cohomology. So Galois cohomology means you take the cohomology groups with respect to the Galois group of the algebraic closure of K with respect to whatever you're taking cohomology of. It turns out that she, etal sheaves over the spectrum of K turn out to be more or less the same as modules over the Galois group. So, so working out this turns out to be a problem in Galois cohomology. And we do this in several steps. So I guess step naught is to say that etal cohomology of the spectrum of field turns out to be Galois cohomology. Um, incidentally, we, we used a special case of this last time because if the um, K is algebraically closed, then all these Galois cohomology groups vanish for, for um, I greater than zero. So um, in order to work out these groups, we first used Sen's theorem, which says that suppose K is field of rational functions on a curve over k where k is algebraically closed. Then k is c1. Well, what on earth does c1 mean? Well, c1 is this funny technical term meaning any homogeneous polynomial in um, um, n variables of degree less than n has a non-zero solution or non-zero root. Um, so for um, finite fields, this is the Chevalier warning theorem and um, Sten proved it for, for um, fields of transcendence degree one over an algebraically closed field. The next step is that um, a C1, if a C1, if a field is C1, then it implies the Brouwer group is trivial. So what's the Brouwer group? Well, the Brouwer group is a group formed out of the central division algebras over the field. Um, so we need the theory of the Brouwer group, which is another of these things I'm going to skip. Um, so in Galois uh, cohomology, the Brouwer group turns out to be isomorphic to the Galois, to, to the Galois cohomology of k bar over k with coefficients in um, the um, non-zero elements of k. So the Brouwer group is the second cohomology. If you're wondering why we don't start with the first cohomology, the reason is very simple. Hilbert's theorem 90 says that the first cohomology is always trivial. So Sen's theorem says that the second cohomology is sometimes trivial. Um, thirdly, there's a theorem from Galois cohomology, which says that if the Brouwer group equals one for all finite extensions, this implies that HQ of K bar over K with coefficients in K bar star is equal to zero for all Q greater than or equal to one. And using the correspondence between Galois cohomology and etal cohomology, this implies the etal cohomology of um, HQ of X with coefficients in the non-zero rational functions is equal to zero for Q greater than or equal to one, which is what we wanted to do. 
Okay, so we've proved some vanishing theorems for cohomology. Now we get on to the long exact sequence of cohomology. So let's write out what the long exact sequence corresponding to the short exact sequence of sheaves is. So it starts off with the zeroth cohomology of the groups in the short exact sequence. So this is going to be a sum over copies of Z. And then this map here isn't necessarily onto, and instead it maps onto the first cohomology. Um, and then we get H1 of the rational functions, and then we get H1 of whatever this thing was. And then that maps onto the second cohomology of GM and so on. And now we use the vanishing theorems we proved. So all this junk vanishes. using Sen's theorem and Brouwer groups and all that other stuff. And all this vanishes um, for rather trivial reasons. And so we see as a consequence that all these groups vanish. So it just leaves H0 and H1 to work out, and that's very easy to work out. So H0 is just the rational functions with no zeros or poles. So this is just isomorphic to um, K star. And here we notice that H naught of this just means we assign an integer to every point. So these are just the divisors on the curve. That's linear combinations of points. And the these are just rational functions. So the image of this is just the principal divisors. So this group here is just the principal divisors divide, sorry, it's, it's, it's just all divisors modulo the principal divisors, which is the divisor class group. And now um, we have to work out the divisor class group. And first of all, every divisor has a degree, which is an integer, so that gives you a factor of z. And then you, that's the product of Z and the divisors of degree zero, which are called the Picard group or Picard variety or whatever. Um, and that has a fairly complicated structure that we'll talk about a little bit later. So um, the cohomology of the multiplicative group of the field um, can be worked out explicitly in terms of the Picard group, which is um, the group of line bundles or the divisor class group or whatever you want to call it. Um, now, we use our knowledge of the cohomology of the multiplicative group to work out the cohomology of um, Z modulo NZ coefficients. So first of all, we notice that um, the, the, the sheaf C over NZ is isomorphic in a non-canonical way to the group of roots of unity, provided N is invertible in our field K. This, this, this is the key point where N has to be invertible. Um, and now we have the following comma exact sequence. One goes to nth roots of unity, goes to GM, goes to GM. So this is raising things to the power of N goes to one. So this is famous Kuma sequence. Um, and there's one very important point here, which is, is this map surjective? And this is surjective in the et al topology, but not the Zariski topology. Um, so in some sense, this the surjectivity of this map is, is the main reason why we're, why we're using the et al topology for, instead of the Zariski topology. Um, much of what we've done so far um, works pretty much the same way in the Zariski topology. For instance, we could calculate the cohomology of X with coefficients in GM, and we get the same answer. It just gives us something involving the Picard group. In fact, calculating this is much easier in the Zariski topology because um, 
you, you remember um, calculating H1 of this group here was really quite difficult in the et al topology. We had to use Sen's theorem and Brouwer groups and whatever. Um, in the Zariski topology, this group here is really easy to calculate and it's very easy to see at zero. The problem is that the same very easy argument that shows that zero also shows that the cohomology of this group vanishes in the Zariski topology, which is not what we want at all. Um, so um, the surjectivity of this map is essentially related to the fact that the map taking z to z to the n is an etal map from c from k star to k star. So, so, so the, the surjectivity of this is, is a sort of key point that you need to pay attention to. Now what we do is we look at the long exact sequence of this. Um, so we know the cohomology of these two groups. So the long exact sequence is going to give us information about the cohomology of this, which is what we want. So let's take a look. We get naught goes to H1, so H0 of mu n, goes to H0 of gm. I'm, I'm missing out x here because I'm getting bored of writing it out. Goes to H0 of gm. And this is multiplication by n. And then here we have H1 of mu n goes to H1 of gm, goes to times n H1 of gm, goes to H2 of mu n. And now this goes to H2 of gm and everything from this point onwards is just zero. So what can we see from this? Well, first of all, we notice that all these higher groups are equal to zero because they 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 just fit into this exact sequence of zeros in front of them and behind them. Now we can pin re recall what these groups are. So this group here was just the um, multiplicative group um, of uh, K. And this group here was the Picard group, Z times pick zero, Z times pick zero. So if we write this out a little bit more neatly in one line, so we can see what's going on, we get the following. Um, we get the following, we have naught goes to H naught of mu, N goes to K star, goes to N K star, goes to H1 of mu N, goes to Picard group, goes to N, and there's the, I guess that should be Z times pick zero, goes to H2 of mu N, goes to zero. And now let's think about this a bit. This map here is surjective. So this map here is the zero map. And this gives us the rather uninteresting information that this group here is just a group of nth roots of unity, which we already knew. Um, now, since this map is zero, this group here is the kernel of the map from z times pick zero um, to itself. So it's the kernel of the, uh, uh, of the map taking x to um, n times x. Um, now, the, the kernel of the map taking z to n, z is zero, so we can forget about that. Um, and we need to know the group of elements of order n in the in the Picard variety. Um, and this takes a fair amount of calculation. This is in fact an abelian variety of dimension equal to g, as shown by Ve in his uh, work on the Ve conjectures. And the elements of order n provided n is invertible, um, is isomorphic to z over nz to the 2g. This takes a fair amount of work that I'm just going to, going to quote. Um, um, now, finally, this group here, well, um, the map from pick zero to pick zero is onto, it's surjective. Again, you need to think about abelian varieties in order to prove this. So we're left with the map from Z to Z, which is multiplication by N, 
Um, so all we're left with here is the group Z modulo NZ. So finally, we see that H0 of um, mu N is equal to Z is isomorphic to mu N. H1 of mu N is isomorphic to um, Z modulo NZ to the 2G. And H2 of mu N is isomorphic to Z over NZ. Um, actually, that probably shouldn't be a Z over NZ, but never mind. Um, um, if yeah, we um, since since we're just assuming mu n is isomorphic to z modulo n z, this doesn't really quite matter how we write this. And I guess I should have said h q of mu n is equal to naught for q greater than two. So um, this is the result we want, remembering that mu n is isomorphic to z over n z. Um, so that gives you the a tal cohomology of a, a curve. Um, this allows you to get hold of a tal cohomology of high dimensional varieties, because what you can do is you can map an n dimensional variety to an n dimensional n minus one dimensional variety, and the fibers will be curves, and you can get hold of the cohomology of the fibers um, by using this result. They might be singular, so you need to do a bit of extra work. And then you can apply spectral sequences to relate the cohomology of your variety to the cohomology of the base and the fibers. And um, so using this basic result about curves, you can sort of climb up to a tal cohomology of higher dimensional varieties. Um, OK, well, one thing I that was really rather seriously missing in this lecture was I never actually explained what an etal map or an etal sheaf was. So next lecture, I plan to say a little bit about what an etal um, morphism of, 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 of varieties or schemes looks like.